Hello and welcome to another video. Uh, today I'm going to be showing you a few swords used in and around England from before the Roman Empire to the end of the medieval era and a, a little bit after the medieval period as well. Okay, so the first sword that I've got for you here is the Celtic sword. Could be named the Celtic Spartha or the Celtic Longsword or um, it could also be called the anthropomorphic sword as well. As you see here, the uh, the pommel and the grip is uh, made to look like a human. You can see the head here and uh, kind of the limbs as well. Uh, the Celts did like that, they thought it was very interesting, so there is a lot of uh, anthropomorphalized stuff. I'm not too sure if that's a word, but we'll go with it. Um, so, some things about the Celtic sword. As you can see, it is fairly wide, it's very broad, uh, it's very long as well. It's also I don't know if you can see it there, but it is rather thick as well, and there is a reason for that. The reason why these are quite thick and quite broad is that uh, Celtic swords were originally actually made out of bronze. However, during the Iron Age, of course, iron and steel were started to be used more um, throughout this time. Um, of course, it was a fairly new concept, and uh, not too many people could actually make iron or steel, and uh, definitely very thin steel, like the late medieval rapier, for example, the Renaissance rapier, uh, was simply not possible uh, in these times, especially for Northwest Europe, for example. Uh, so, for now at least, they did have to be fairly, uh, fairly thick and fairly broad, which did mean they're fairly heavy and fairly clunky, and uh, that is definitely true. Um, there are upsides to this though, it's not all downsides of being a hefty uh, sword. For example, uh, this was a chopper. It was definitely good for chopping things. And uh, this is very good actually because in the Iron Age there wasn't actually too much in the way of armour. Sure, there was mail, there was the um, Loris Segmentata, for example, in uh, Roman times. Uh, there are shields and helmets as well, both bronze and iron. Um, however, in the way of actual body armour, there wasn't all too much. It's mainly just tunics. Uh, so if you had a decent chopper that could deliver a lot of power, just chopping its way through people, that was pretty much all you needed in the Celtic times. Uh, definitely pre-Roman area, at least. So the second sword I've got here is the... Roman Gladius, and I'm just going to show you one thing with a Roman Gladius before we start off. I have, of course, the scabbard here, and if we put the sword in the scabbard, that's a great sound, but taking that out of the scabbard is something quite more special. I'm just going to do it near the mic here, so you can see. Hopefully I won't have a mic. Oh, that is a good sound, isn't it? That is a very good sound. Uh, so, what I'm going to do... Just show you a little bit about the uh, the Gladius here. So this one is of course quite grand wire, though they were usually made either just with uh, bone or wooden core and uh, maybe even a w wooden pommel and uh, cross guard. Uh, but they're mainly made out of steel. Now, of course, as I mentioned before with the Celtic sword, um, Iron was a new thing, a fairly new thing to come to Northern uh, Europe and Britain. However, in Italy, uh, in the Roman times, uh, they were making these all the time. Uh, they were giving them to soldiers to use, and the soldiers would most definitely use these. So it's quite light, of course, it is quite short, it uses less material. Something that's commonly taught within uh, medieval history and arms and armour and along that line is that Whoever has the most reach has the upper hand. This isn't always the case though. It should be said that a longer reach only gives you an upper hand if your enemy isn't right pressed up in front of you. It actually hinders you in this case because what you really need is just a shorter weapon, a lighter weapon, just to do the job, stab really quick and then you're done. So the Romans used these short swords and to be honest with you, other swords around this time, of course I know the Celtic sword I showed you was quite long, but most swords around this period in history weren't actually too much longer than this. This was fairly standard. If you think about the uh, Greek coppice or the Spanish falcata, for example, uh, they were actually fairly the same size to this. So it wasn't necessarily a short sword, and in fact, gladius literally just translates to sword. So these gladius swords became so popular that you would have a big scutum shield, big rectangular shield to make sure that 
their reach isn't going to mean anything if they can't actually hit over your shield anyway. And then you press right up against them and just quick stab them in the ribs. And that is how the Roman Gladius came so powerful. And of course, I'm talking Roman at the moment. I just introduced a video saying I'm talking about English swords. Well, that is true because, of course, in 55 AD, the Romans did actually invade England. They battled the Celts, so the Celtic sword I showed you would quite literally have clashed with this sword in the past. The third sword that I've got with me to show you today is the Saxon Sax, or the Saax. Not too sure how to pronounce that, I've heard different things, but Sax is easier. As you can see here, it is a kind of war knife. It is just an oversized knife. Just going to put the sheath down for a while here. So the Saxons would use uh, these war knives during their raids around 400 to 500 AD. This wasn't the only type of weapon they used, of course. They did have different types of swords. They also favoured the spear, the axe or the bow. But the sax was quite special. It was kind of a utility knife that you could also use in times of warfare. In fact, they would actually say that you could even use the sax on your back in times of peace and on your side in times of conflict. So if you were raided, you could just quickly get it out, run in, start fighting. But as well as that, you could also use it to chop your vegetables or of course slaughter a cow. The fourth sword that I'm going to show today is probably one of the most popular swords, other than of course the Roman Gladius, it is the Viking Broadsword. Even though technically it's not a broadsword so to speak, but other than just saying sword over and over again, I think we can class this as rather broad. So the Vikings used these swords uh, anywhere between the 6th century AD to the 11th century AD. Of course they raided around 8th century AD to Britain in Lindisfarne, which is again very famous, before of course attacking the Normans and the Saxons throughout the whole wars leading up to the Battle of Hastings. Now, unlike the Romans, you didn't have loads of people churning out swords all the time in blacksmiths in big cities or anything like that during the Viking period, because they were much smaller clans and smaller tribes and it would be quite expensive to have a sword made for you. It was seen as a sign of stature if you were to have an iron or steel sword uh, because they were just so expensive. Same thing goes for a male shirt, a chain mail for example. Um, they were quite expensive to make, they were very time consuming to make, therefore you would be seen as quite rich, quite noble if you could afford such things. A cheaper alternative, of course, to a Viking sword would be a Viking spear, a bearded axe, a Dane axe, or, of course, just bow and arrow. Now, another thing to mention as well about the Viking broadsword is that it's actually a member of the Spartha family. Um, before the Vikings, of course, the Romans had cavalry and they had longer versions of their gladius swords, which again were fairly broad swords, and the blade is very similar to this. Moving forward now to the 12th century, and here we have a more or less typical Crusader's 12th century sword. First things you'll notice is that the blade has suddenly become quite a bit thinner. Uh, this is because steelworking and swordsmithing at this time had now become more refined, uh, which was definitely a very positive thing in moving uh, weapons forward during this age. Um, you also find as well that it's taken on quite a crucifix form. It definitely has uh, some religious symbolism here, and that's of course because uh, the Normans and the uh, Crusaders, they thought that if you had a sword uh, that resembled a cross, that was seen as kind of like a, a good luck blessing, a holy blessing, uh, that when you go into war, you are going to be the victor. As you can see here as well from me uh, swinging around this sword like anything, um, it was considerably lighter than the Viking broadsword that I showed you earlier. Um, it was also more accessible to the common soldier as well, so you saw swords becoming more popular on the battlefield for slashing and stabbing and thrusting and all kinds of things. However, it shouldn't be underestimated that both the spear and the axe were very prevalent on the battlefield during this time as well. 
Moving on now, and we have the 13th century or even 14th century uh, sword here. Uh, so of course this is still, it's called an arming sword and uh, you'll find out here that it's got much more a tapered point, so it means it's much more used for thrusting rather than slashing. During the 13th and 14th century, armour was becoming a lot better, it was encompassing a lot more of the human body as well, and just protecting the person a lot better during a battlefield. Due to steel armour being so popular during this time, slashing with a sword is really not going to do anything, so instead you'd want to do thrusts between the armour, maybe between the eye slits, the armpit, or of course the crotch. However, it should also be taken into consideration that during this time, the sword or the usage of the sword was slowly beginning to drop off um, and actually be replaced with other things such as maces and war hammers because you really need more of a crushing weapon against things like full suits of armour rather than a slashing weapon. Moving forward now, you've got around the 14th and 15th century, and as you can see, what has happened to swords? They have got a lot bigger. Now, there is a reason for this. Of course, from what I mentioned just earlier about the 13th and 14th century arming sword, the one-handed sword, is that slashing was really not going to inflict too much damage nowadays on the battlefield. So, instead of slashing, they would still do the slashing. However, a much bigger sword that you can actually hold with two hands instead of one means that not only could you slash an opponent but that slashing motion could actually send the person to the floor once an armored knight is on the floor they are very vulnerable even though you could easily just jump up again armor was not this heavy as definitely not as heavy as people think it was still going to hinder you just that little bit more, just to give enough time for the person who sent you to the floor to whip out his dagger and stab you. So, despite swords still being used on the battlefield, they really weren't going to be the weapon to kill someone, how they were usually the weapon to push someone to the floor, so then you could get out a better weapon, like a dagger or a knife for example, and end them. Going a bit further now from the 14th and 15th century sword, you have another type of 15th century sword. Now, I know what you're thinking, this does look fairly similar. However, these swords were actually, and you can't really see in the video, I do appreciate, um, these were actually slightly longer than the previous sword that I've shown you. Now, these had a strange name to them. They were known as, well, the long sword, perhaps a two-handed sword. They were also known as the bastard sword. There isn't really any classification as to exactly why they were named this, um, but a lot of 15th century swords were known as bastard swords. So still, as you can see, fairly long fairly uh, still dangerous but it's not going to kill you on the battlefield you can slash at someone as much as you like you can thrust at someone as much as you like but it really isn't going to kill someone again you just want something big and something cumbersome just to smash someone down on the floor and then just jump on them with all your might and get the dagger in and stab them however as good as these swords look they were no longer prevalent on the battlefield anymore they were largely replaced by things like pole axes halberds spears pikes. Now the final sword I've got for you here today is the two-handed sword. This is kind of after the medieval period really, uh, in a time where there were pikemen, muskets, heavy artillery such as cannons and mortars, and cavalry as well. But you'd still use two-handed swordsmen, however in a very specific manner. You'd have ranks of pikemen, and in amongst those ranks, every now and then you would have a two-handed swordsman. They're usually a mercenary, they're usually paid extra, so more than the pikemen were, except for if a pikeman on the front line, they would also get paid double everyone else. But the reason that they would get paid so much more is because the two-handed swordsman's role was to jump into the enemy ranks, just start flailing around the sword, and just trying to break up the enemy pikemen ranks as much as you can. As soon as their line is broken, your pikes can just rush in and take care and do all the damage they need to. Of course, though, this is a suicide job, so what people actually used to do was they used to go around to prisons or uh, places for the mentally ill. They used to say, hey, do you want to get paid? You can come out of your prison, you can come out of your home, uh, I'll give you a sword. All you have to do is go into the ranks and flail it around like a wild man. 
and some prisoners, or even mentally ill, they would do this. So they were given a sword, given a helmet, given some armour, they are put in the front ranks, and they would just charge. Of course, that could just be a silly story. However, there is actually documents of two-handed swordsmen, like Landschnecks, for example. They would flail around, and some of them apparently could chop the heads off three pikemen at once. Whether you believe that or not, I'll leave that one up to you. So that was my little list of English swords used throughout the medieval period and of course a little bit before the medieval period as well, just to give a little bit of a backdrop of history there. Uh, I hope you enjoyed and uh, by all means I'll see you in the next video. Don't forget of course to like and subscribe and click the little uh, notification bell as well and see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.